welcome everyone. I'm going to get us started. Thanks for coming on a, on a Friday morning. I'm very happy to introduce Claire Camp Dush, who is Associate Professor at Ohio State University. She is a scholar of families in the life course and an affiliate of the Population Research Institute at Ohio State. Claire is an award-winning scholar teacher, having won her university's highest teaching honor just this past year, the OSU Alumni Award for Distinguished Teaching, and a few years ago, winning the Jesse Bernard Award for Outstanding Contribution to Feminist Scholarship by the National Council of Family Relations for her article, Production of Inequality, the Gender Division of Labor Across the Transition to Parenthood. She's published more than 50 articles, mostly co-authored with students, <laughs> In articles like journal of marriage, and, uh, in journals like uh, Journal of Marriage and Family, advances in life course research, social science research, social science, and medicine. As a family demographer, Claire is working on two new data collection projects that are funded by the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute uh, on Aging, and both will be among the first to collect population representative, fully powder powered studies of couples in both uh, different and same gender pairs. This will open new avenues for her own and for others' research on the range of family forms. I think we'll be hearing maybe at the end today a little bit about those efforts. Uh, I know uh, for those in attendance, our department, departmental norms uh, here in sociology are to hold questions until the end of the presentation. Only smaller point of clarification questions during the talk, please. We've asked Claire to leave 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for Q&A. So please join me in welcoming Claire Camp Dosh. Great, thank you all. Um, it's great to be here. So I just wanted to start out talking a little bit about my program of research. And so I kind of have three themes through my research. One is the development of intimate relationships and their intersection with health. And that's also where some of my new projects lie. Another one is thinking about the division of labor across the transition to parenthood. And that's using novel data that we collected at Ohio State. And a third is looking at life course trends in union formation and dissolution. And then I kind of have a cross cut theme that I use a lot of causal methods. I was trained, um, one of my advisors or my postdoc mentor was an economist that made me really picky about all kinds of things. Um, so I like to use a lot of causal methods in my work. So my agenda for today is I'm going to start out talking about um, my age period cohort effects project. And so some of you that may have been at my talk in April, this, some of our this talk will be very familiar to you. Um, so for those of you that are new, I'm going to talk about that and have updated it a little bit. Um, I'm also going to talk about the work in family life study. And I'm going to talk just a little bit, if we have time, about the New Parents Project and some of my work with the New Parents Project. And then finally talking about my new project, the National Couples as Health and Time Study. So I definitely take a life course perspective across all of my work, um, thinking about development in context, thinking about human agency, the way that individuals have the power over their own choices, definitely thinking about linked lives and families and couples, and also with children, and also thinking about timing and location and time and space. And specifically here, I'm going to be thinking about um, timing, location, and time and space um, with this project. So I wanted to start out talking a little bit about the second demographic transition also connects to the suffocation of marriage models. So you know how disciplines like to talk about the same things but in different kinds of ways but not cite each other? <laughs> um, so that's kind of what this is about. So as sociologists and demographers, we talk about the second demographic transition, which are the changes to union formation and dissolution since the 1950s. And they include delayed marriage and childbearing. Um, increased non-marital co competition in unions and union instability. So that whole package of demographic trends has been called the second demographic transition. When Lasagi started um, making arguments for why this is happening, he put forth the second demographic transition theory. And one of those is that what's driving these changes is ideational change. 
And this ideational theory suggests that as countries become increasingly educated, economically developed, and more secularized, societal focus shifts from a focus of fulfillment of basic material needs to higher order needs, including self-actualization and individual autonomy. Ironically, social psychologists have made a very similar argument, and that would be the suffocation of marriage model that I have here. So when we specifically apply that to the idea of marriage, the idea is that as we've gone through the second demographic transition, and as we've had these um, transitions to the society focusing on higher order needs, it has affected our perceptions of our intimate relationships and our expectations of them. So this is a model, um, Mount Maslow, for um, thinking about these um, different sets of needs that individuals have. And the argument is that we used to be focused, you know, back in the day when there were saber-toothed tigers, physiological needs, and then as we moved into um, having some of those met, then we were focused on belonging and safety and esteem. And the idea is that now that we have those needs met, we have very high expectations of our intimate relationships. And we're expecting our partners to be our best friend, our an amazing lover, um, the best source of social support, and all of the things as opposed to having like a diverse group of people to provide those needs, the expectation is that your partner is going to provide all of them. So that is the argument that lies behind um, both the second demographic transition theory um, and this idea of ideational change and also lies behind um, the social psychological theory. I'll also mention two economists have said the same thing. Um, they've made the same argument. So this is kind of across the disciplines though. Like I said, disciplines aren't always good at citing each other. So based on the suffocation of marriage idea, or you could think about it as a second demographic transition idea, the idea would be that as our expectations for our intimate relationships have changed, but the ways that marriage, um, the ways that partnering happens hasn't changed, that marital quality would decline, and um, both across cohorts, so over time, um, and also across periods. So. Um, across cohorts, when I say across cohorts, I mean that people that married later or people that are older should have lower quality relationships than those that married earlier in a time whenever um, marital equality wasn't the end all be all of marriage. And that same idea of period effects, even if you were married at the earlier time, you're living through a period where people have higher expectations of marriage, you're seeing societal you know, messages around marriage, and you're still going to experience a marital decline because it's hard to meet those highest order needs. That's like the basic, one of the basic arguments underlying this is that it's hard to meet these very higher order needs by one person to meet those needs. Um, there's an alternate perspective we could take here though, and that kind of comes more from our sociological theory. So Andy Cherlin and Sarah McClanahan, who are two leading family demographers and sociologists, have suggested that marriage is now out of reach for many less educated working class and poor couples in the US. Um, so we do know that less educated couples are less likely to marry and instead may experience cohabitation or single parenthood. Um, we also know that their unions, if they are cohabiting, are more likely to end in disillusion. And if they do marry, we know they're more likely to divorce. And so this diverging destinies perspective suggests that those individuals who are most at risk for divorce and who are most at risk for low quality marriages are going to select out of our samples, right? Because they aren't even going to make it into a marital union. And so that should shift the marital population in important ways. And the way that it could shift the marital population is that it could shift it such that marital quality may actually have risen over time, um, both for all of those individuals, um, a period effect, and also for cohorts. So that's the idea here for this diverging destiny's perspective. So you'll notice I didn't talk about age, so I want to talk a little bit about previous research and then talk a little bit about age. So first of all, um, Amato et al., there hasn't been that much previous research that has tried to compare these trends over time. And so Amato et al. Um, used the marital instability across the life course data, which I will be talking a little bit more about, that was collected in 1980, and a symmetrical work and family life study data that was collected in 2000. Here's the book that they wrote off these data. And they found no change in marital happiness between 1980 and 2000 in these two cohorts. So, um, but that's, there hasn't been much else besides that. So thinking about age. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about age because the last time I was here, um, Rob called me out in a nice way, very politely, and suggested that maybe we don't even have age creating cohort effects here. So I really was thinking about that. So I want to contextualize age and talk a little bit about how I'm going to be treating it and when I try to look at these trends. So first of all, um, for years, and probably until um, maybe the early 2000s, I think, ish, yeah, um, most textbooks, like sociology, sociology of the Family textbooks, when they talked about marital quality, talked about this U-shaped curve of marital quality. So you start high, um, it goes down when you have kids, and then it goes back up, is the general idea of the U-shaped curve. Marble Glenn had work on this, I think using some of the same data I'm using here, so that was always the idea. Um, and Van Leningham, Amato, and Johnson in 2001 looked at this um, in the marital instability across life course data. So that data started in 1980 and then they collected data in 1983, 88, 92, 97, and 2000 from the same individuals, so longitudinally. And they were able, using the cross-sectional reports of marital happiness, to reconstruct this U-shaped curve. But when they looked at it in fixed effects models and were able to look longitudinally at the same people over time, they did not find evidence of a U-shaped curve. And rather, they just found this very depressing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it always starts high and just goes down. Um, so that's what they found from those models. So this approach was using. Um, you know, it used a longitudinal data and looked at real duration and just had this depressing, sad message about marriage. So, um, a few years ago, um, 2008, it's been a while now, I keep forgetting that time marches on, um, my colleague Miles Taylor and I decided that we would look at these, um, these same data and use a more person-centered approach like class analysis and see what we would find in the data, whether um, using that approach if you saw these same, um, these same patterns. And so what we actually found is an overall high marriage pattern that did it had very little change, and about 40% of the sample was in that group. We found like a middle pattern which had a little bit of a curvilinear change um, that about 40% of the sample was in that group and we found about 20% of the sample was in this low category that just stayed kind of um, at the lower end of their marital quality. Now recently I was working on getting my dossier together for full and interestingly I came across this article that I hadn't seen because I've been kind of working in other areas and they did, um, this is by Chris Prawl who's my colleague at Mizzou and her and her colleagues looked at all of the group based trajectory models of marital quality so all of the studies that have been done on it and there's now been 14 studies using these trajectory models and all of them for the most part with a little bit of flexibility but for the most part, most of them are finding this idea of the honeymoon, a ceiling is what they call it, the honeymoon, a ceiling effect that marital quality is probably largely stable and deviates little from its initial value in most studies. And so because I know that cross-sectional data often gives us the U-shaped curve. And when I was here last time when I was trying to estimate the APC models, the age period cohort models, I did, was able to replicate that U-shaped curve. But I know from all the other research that actually that's a data artifact of cross-sectional data on marital quality. So as I was thinking about my APC models, I realized, do I even need an age period and cohort? And if I would cut age out of my model, then actually I don't have my problem that age period cohort models have, which is they're identified, fully identified. So, um, and also there's been some suggestions that, the, that all of the different ways, um, so I've done a lot of reading on this, all of the different ways that we try to go about estimating APC models, for the most part, have serious limitations to them and are hard to identify. So what I'm going to talk, what I've decided to try today, and of course I'll be interested in hearing your feedback, is I'm just going to estimate the period in the cohort. Um, I would like to have age at marriage in here to at least account for age in some sense. Unfortunately, in the data I'm using, I don't have that variable, but I'm gonna use a few other variables to try to at least capture somewhat um, this idea of um, capturing some of the variability around age. So, my research questions, what are the period and cohort effects in marital happiness over time? I'm using data from the General Social Survey, which is a repeated cross-section design. Um, the data were collected between 1972, and I'm using the 2018 through 2018 data here. 
They're collected annually, then biannually, then annually, then biannually. So we have kind of um, you know interesting ways that the data were collected. The annual sample ranges from a minimum in 1990 of about 1,300 to a maximum of over 4,000 to 2,006. Almost all of these data are collected in person. A few people are collected on the phone. Um, the data are population representative. There are weights in the data, and I will be weighting these data. Um, I don't use data from 1972 because marital happiness was not asked then. And to create the sample for this paper, I dropped all the respondents who are missing data on marital happiness, either due to singlehood or widowhood, and those are the primary reasons that individuals did not answer this question, or were missing data on the weights. And there's very few people missing data on weights, like 30. Um, the final sample size is around 30,000. Okay, so here's my variable. Um, it's not the greatest, but it has three categories. Taking all things together, how would you describe your marriage? Would you say that your marriage is very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy? Interestingly, almost everybody says their marriage is very happy and pretty happy, and few people say that their marriage is not too happy. So these are just some descriptive statistics of the of the sample. So it's primarily white, um, a little over half female. Eighty-six percent of individuals have any child, and twenty-three percent have a child under six years old. So that's one way that I'm trying to um, help deal with um, people's not age, but try to deal with somewhat with reducing some of the heterogeneity that may be associated with age. And then I have the education levels here. Um, a majority are high school grads, but it's um, you know pretty evenly split. And then about 20% have ever been divorced. So period was coded as the year of the interview, and cohort was coded as the birth year. Um, and when you're looking at the data, just a little reminder that you can think about um, the greatest generation through 1928, the silent generation um, between 2845, the boomers, then we have Gen X, and we have a few millennials, and the median is 1948. So I'm going to use an ordered logit here for these data. The data were weighted. I'm going to test for both linear and quadratic effects because I've run these models a few different ways. And um, the when I ran it the one way, it looked pretty curvilinear. So I decided that I would go ahead and test for those effects. So I do find significant effects of cohort and um, the quadratic effect of, for period and for cohort and these were logit models and I'm controlling for all of those things that I mentioned and also weighting the data. And overall, it's a kind of de a depressing picture. So comparing, um, this is comparing the very happy category to the other categories. We see a decrease in the likelihood of um, very happy marriages by cohort. And we also see a decrease in the likelihood of very happy marriages by um, period. So overall, it supports the idea that marital quality is going down. Um, also, I don't break out the pretty happy marriages from the very happy mar or from the not too happy marriages because so this is comparing very happy to both pretty happy and not too happy because the numbers are pretty small. So overall, in this paper. Um, it suggests that potentially marital quality has declined by cohort and has declined by period, which would support the idea of the second demographic transition and the idea that ideational change and our expectations for our marriages are impacting our marital quality. Um, so I'm surprised that you don't, I don't see more um, that would support the diverging destinies and maybe if you have some ideas for ways I could try to better get at that, I'm, ooh, I'm happy to hear about that because it does seem like there should be some selection into marriage and that should be increasing the um, marital quality of that population, um, but I'm not finding, at least in these models, evidence of that. But there are some limitations. So I have a one item measure of marital quality, which isn't great. Um, uh, everybody in this sample is in a different gender marriage, and now we have individuals who can be married that aren't in, that are not with different gender spouses. 
Um, there's a lack of dyadic or longitudinal data here, so as opposed to what Amato et al. was able to do with the marital um, instability across the life course data, um, I'm not able to do any kind of modeling of longitudinal trends here because it's a repeated cross-section. And I have no measure of year of marriage, age of marriage, or year of first marriage across time. They stopped asking about that in 1994, so I've been thinking about potentially doing it just using up to 1994, and then I could at least put a control for age of marriage into the model and maybe help with this age effect, um, but not fully identify the model. Some ways that I'm trying to address the limitations here is the work and family life study, and I have a little picture of Leslie Nope here for any of you that like Parks and Rec, and she says that we have to remember what's important in life, friends, waffles, and work, or waffles, friends, and work, but work has to come third, and the reason why I put that is because I call this study waffles. So if you hear me, so that's the... Um, so if you hear me talk about waffles, this is the project I'm talking about. This grant was just awarded in September, um, a few weeks ago, so that's very, very exciting. And um, the title, it's with my colleague Miles Taylor, who I mentioned that I worked on um, with my marital quality stuff, and it's called the All or Nothing Marriage, question mark, marital function and health among individuals and same in different gender marriages. So what we're going to be doing is, again, like the GSS, it has a repeated cross-sectional design. So I've already talked about the marital instability across the life course data, and that is what this 1980 wave was called, the marital instability across the life course. So I did mention that there is a book alone together that I showed you a picture of that they got another cohort in the year 2000 of individuals in different gender marriages, and that's here. And so uh, as 2020 approached for three years, I tried to get funded and finally was successful um, a grant to collect a third repeated cross-section of this data. And what we're going to be able to do is do hopefully some of the kinds of modeling that we just discussed, but be able to look at it with much better measures than we're able to do with um, the GSS. So it's a repeated cross-sectional design. The age range is 18 to 55 at each wave. Um, these two waves were conducted by phone. In the grant, I said that I was going to conduct this 2020 wave on the phone, so I budgeted for that. However, of course, you take a budget cut at NIH. Um, in, this, in this case, it's funded by the National Institute on Aging. So I think we're probably going to do the same gender couples in an online framework and then do some different gender couples online and in person because my data collection partner with this is Gallup and they've assured me that in 20 years there will be no such thing as phone data collection and there barely is now. So um, we're going to be collecting some of the data online as well but right now my plan was to get 2,000 adults, 1,000 men and women in different gender marriages and 600 adults, 300 men and 300 women in same gender marriages. We also want to do an online supplement because we, this summer we've been working on the survey and I've been telling some of you some of the questions are really sexist um, because they were written in like the late 1970s um, in a very different time in American families. So like for example, only the women are asked if they worked the year before they got married. And I was like, why are they only the women ask that? And my colleague Smiles was like, it's because women stopped working when they got married sometimes. And anyway, so we're revising the questionnaire, but we also wanted to update some of the measures and do some better measurement because measurement has come away since um, 1980. So we're also going to be doing an online supplement, and that supplement will be able to be harmonized with the National Couples as Health and Time study that I'll talk about later. Um, one also reason also for the supplement is one issue um, when I went under review is that individuals, um, by individuals I mean the reviewers, did not like the fact that I didn't have cohabiting couples in this sample. Though to me, marriage is still valid to study on its own, um, but I was getting pushback on that. So the nice thing is that there's cohabiting couples in the National Couples Health and Time Study, so we can always you know, do something with those if we want to do some comparative work with the harmonized data. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, my work on the division of labor. And so, um, in the interest of time, and because I want to talk about my other study, I don't have a ton of literature review here, but I'm going to be talking about the paper that Ann mentioned in another paper that I've done with the time diary data. Um, a lot of our 
Time Diary data and our estimates about the division of labor in the U.S. comes from the American Time Use Survey, right? And the reason why we use Time Diary data to look at some of these things is that individuals are bad at estimating their time, and we're going to talk about that. So. My colleague, um, Sarah Shelby Sullivan, was starting to work on a project um, right after I got to Ohio State, and she, we called it the New Parents Project, and um, we were looking at the transition to parenthood. At that time, I realized that we actually know very little about the actual transition of parenthood among unmarried couples, even though 40, over 40% 40 of births in the United States are to unmarried couples, so it's kind of interesting. Like, we know fragile families data, right? But that's all after the babies are here. So we, have, we decided to collect um, a subsample of couples that were cohabiting, so there are some cohabiting couples in here, and I have one paper using our small cohabiting couple sample that I really love, um, but it doesn't get very much play, so if you want to ask me about it later, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, but that's the reason why I got involved with the project. Um, as happens when you bring a family demographer to work with a developmental psychologist, our study changed because of both of our perspectives. And one way that it changed is I brought my, develop, my dem demographic perspective and the ways that we use demographic data to bear on the design of the study. So um, I was going to be talking about some of the ways that intersected here. So this study had two aims. Um, one was to compare the division of labor, and that included market and non-market work, both prior to and across the transition of parenthood, and to compare time diary and survey estimates of the division of labor across the transition of parenthood. So, as I said, the New Parents Project was really informed by all of the disciplines that were represented on our design team. And that's one thing that's important to me as I think about design. So like my, um, I have boards, advisory boards for both of my projects, for both Waffles and the new couple, the National Couples' Health and Time Study, and I try to get a diversity of perspectives. And that's partly because of the cool ways that it shaped the New Parents Project. So it's a longitudinal study of 364 parents and 182 couples. The data was collected between 2008 and 2010, though we have gone back to the couples. Um, the children are, in, well, when we went back to the couples, they were between nine and 10. Um, everybody were dual earner couples. They were all different sex or different gender couples from the Midwest, um, expecting their first child. Uh, most of them were married, but not everybody, as I said. Um, a lot of them were mostly in their late 20s and early 30s. They were fluent in English, um, had plans to return to work after the birth of their child um, for both men and women. But it was primarily a white college educated middle class sample, upper middle class sample probably. So here are some of the really cool data that we got from this project. So we got survey data, and the survey data had lots of different kinds of measures in it. Um, but one cool thing we got is time diaries that were modeled off the American Time Use Survey, but we collected them ourselves. So um, we had everything that individuals did from 4 a.m. on a work day to 4 a.m. the next day and on a non-work day. And then we also have really cool observational data. So yesterday at lunch, it kind of came up about thinking about qualitative data versus quantitative data. And although this isn't an example of qualitative data, it is an example that there's a lot of different ways to collect data and a lot of different ways to analyze our research questions, and this is a way that we worked with. Um, so for example, this is where they played with a fake baby, and then we coded it to see how much the dad's boss, the mom's around with, or the mom's boss, the dad's around with the fake baby. Um, this is a marital conflict conversation that we collected. This is a triadic play situation where they were both playing with the baby, and um, sometimes we would have parents like slide the baby away from their partner. So really interesting interactions you can observe between parents um, when they're playing with their baby together. Um, this is a parent-child interaction, and then this is a, something where we had them change the baby into a onesie, which also is really interesting. So you're coding all of those things for how the couple talks to each other, how they interact with the baby, and um, it's just really fun, really fun project. So um, I'm going to be talking today about the time diary data, and we got the time diaries in the third trimester, so nobody was a parent at that point. And then at three, six, and nine months postpartum, though we don't use the the six month, it was like too close in time. We should, if we did it over, we wouldn't even have the six month time point because people were just we had low response rates there. We had better response rates at nine months postpartum because they we collected the data at our local science center, so that was kind of fun, and people got like a science center membership if they came into the project. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about is our time diary and our survey data. So we asked individuals 
to report their um, their routine and their non-routine housework and we asked them to and so we coded it ourselves in the time diaries so if someone reported that they were cooking that was coded as routine housework and then we asked them to estimate in the surveys how much time they spent doing things like this and then we also had non-routine housework outdoor maintenance and auto repair so I'm assuming most of us here know that there's a little bit of a gendered nature to these things so I always try to point out because men are like we mow the yard um, that yeah we are capturing that but it doesn't, you don't mow the yard um, quite as much as you wash the dishes, if you do wash the dishes. Um, so I just wanted to mention that we do have that in there, the more typically meal things that people get defensive about. Um, we also have child care in here. So we, um, because of developmental psychology and working with the developmentalist, we separate out physical child care from engagement. So physical child care is like feeding, changing diapers, and we asked this both in the time diary, and we coded it from the time diary, asked it in the survey. And then in the time diary only, we also had a measure of engagement, which was reading with the baby, playing with the baby, attending the baby's events. I mean, I don't even know if the baby had events, but <laughs> as, a, as a mother, I know I attend lots of kid events. <laughs> um, soothing or holding the baby or talking with the baby. I'm assuming the baby had few events. Okay, and then we also looked at paid work, which is the third kind of work that we do in families. Um, and we looked at it in the time diary, which was working, checking, work email, commuting, or any other income generating activities. And then we also looked at it in the survey, um, which was estimated at how many hours per week do you work. So um, for this one, we used the midpoints of each response when we looked at it because we made it continuous. And then we also um, assigned respondents a, a, a value of 55 hours if they said 50 plus. But a few people, like 11% of men and 5% of women reported working more than 50 hours a week. But still, that's like not nothing. So that's kind of sad. Okay. Um, of course, all of you are probably like, I totally work more than 50 hours a week, so. Okay, so back to, so those, so those are our variables. Time diary, total work, um, what, and that variable included all of the work. Um, and then we had the survey total work. Um, because we only had engagement in the time diaries and we didn't ask an estimate of how often you were doing those more fun kind of child care, the engaging with the baby things, and the survey, um, I have those separated out. So we did paired t-test um, with change score, difference and difference models. Um, and we did look at effect sizes here. And for those of you that use effect sizes um, for this kind of sample size, uh, D of 0.2 is considered a small, 0.5 is a medium, and 0.8 is usually considered a large effect. So here are some results. And this is from the paper that Anne mentioned that was um, our 2015 paper. And so what you can see here is that women um, perceived that they increased, um, oh gosh, I don't have these labeled very well, do I? Oh yeah, okay. They increased their housework by, they perceived they increased their housework across the transition by five hours. They perceived that they decreased their paid work by three hours. And they perceived that they increased their total workload across the transition to parenthood by 30 hours. So that's, that's child care added in there, right? So this is just the housework, paid work, and we don't have a before after for child care because there is no before for child care. I mean, we did, you could pay, say, like in the third trimester, I was putting my crib together, but the numbers were so low. Um, and then the men, that are well this is the so this is what we found from the time diary so this is what they reported self-reported in their survey from the time diary data we found that women dropped their housework by about an hour that they increased their paid work by 0.7 but those aren't even significant and that they increased their total workload which was significant by about 15 hours across the transition to parenthood so for those that had a baby they increased their workload by about 15 hours and the men had a different pattern of results it was a pretty similar pattern for the survey data, so we found that men increased their workload or perceived they did by 15 hours of housework, that there was little change in paid work, and that they perceived that they increased their total workload by 30 hours by the time you add in the childcare. 
And then we found that when we looked at the time diary data, that men actually decreased their time in housework by five hours a week. Um, they did not change in their paid work, and their overall workload increase was five hours. Because of the decrease in the housework, they didn't have as much of a bump up in their total workload after the transition of parenting. So one thing, and then, okay, so then I have some estimates here for you where you can see um, this is the men's change in housework, this is the women's change in housework, and these are the, um, I think these are the survey estimates. You can see the effect sizes, they are significantly different. Here's the paid work changes. Um, yeah, so here's the time diary estimates. You can see the total workload according to the time diaries. Men increased their workload by five hours, by 15 hours, and these were um, big effect sizes. And then when we add an engagement, so that's like the playing with the baby, because sometimes individuals make these arguments that men are more likely to do those kinds of fun, more fun kinds of childcare and avoid um, things like changing diapers. And this, is, of course, is all in different gender couples. Did I mention that? So we're talking about gender. This is all gender context here. Um, we found that men increased their workload by about 12 hours um, and women by about 20. So women still were doing more than men, even including that more fun kind of childcare. And then this just shows the survey estimates, which I've kind of already talked about, but you see, if we would have relied only on the survey estimates, we would have predicted no difference in the total workload across the transition of parenthood for men and women. So I think that's good evidence that we can't always trust people's perceptions. Like I'll often say to my students, um, if someone's feeling overwhelmed or if my students are feeling overwhelmed, I'll say, well, try doing a time diary for a day or two. Like track your time, see where your time is going, because you might be really surprised on how much time you're spending on something. I did that recently with a student. She emailed me that she took, um, she did this quiz and she emailed me that it took 90 minutes to do. Um, so I was like, oh, that's not good. But then I went into Canvas and it took her five. And so, but she didn't know I could see that. So we had this really awkward email exchange. So my point is we're not good at estimating our time. Okay, so then this is a paper I just published last year. We were wondering, what are men doing while women are doing more work? Um, also, I forgot to mention, one thing I should mention is that women, you, I, I kind of glossed over, but women also perceived that they um, dropped their paid work hours, but they didn't change it. So that's kind of interesting. There's a whole gender conversation to have about that. Anyway, what are men doing while women are doing work? So this is just one um, graph that's pretty easy to see from this paper. And so I suggest people check it out. It's kind of interesting. So this is a small sample. So I, you, I merged together in Stata. I did like some really good Stata data manipulation. I created a minute-by-minute -minute file of the time diary data. So just explained the data by how long they're doing the activities. And then merged mom and dad's data together if they reported the same day. And then I could see on the same line of date, on the same line, this minute dad was doing X and this minute mom was doing Y. And so basically what we found, when fathers were doing childcare, Women most often were also doing childcare. They were engaging with the baby or playing with the baby. They were doing routine housework and about, and then this is the non-routine, the mowing the yard or outdoor repair, things like that. And then about 18% of the time they were doing, this is on a weekend, they were doing leisure, then there was this little slice for work because it's on a weekend. And then what fathers were doing when women were doing childcare, half the time they were doing leisure and then the rest of it was split between um, Oh gosh, what we got here? Child care, engagement, uh, routine housework, and non-routine housework. And a little bit more work for men. But overall we found that um, there was potentially some of this maternal gatekeeping going on, which is a concept that my colleague Sarah works a lot on. And the idea is that women sometimes manage men's parenting and they can open up the gate and help men facilitate men's parenting, or they can close the gate and um, kind of stop it or imp impede it. Um, but also I think that we can't just blame women for this or if we are blaming anybody for these patterns. But men also have preferences and they may not like doing some of these things and they may just be better at implementing their preferences. I also think there's an intensive mothering thing to think about here because this is a pretty highly educated middle class sample and we know that there's a lot of intensive mothering gendered expectations of women's parenting. 
So some limitations of this project is we have a small community sample, it's primarily white, highly educated, and it's only different gender couples. So I wanted to turn to talking a little bit about my project called the National Couples as Health and Time Study, which came out partly out of this project and also um, was inspired by the fact that the last time we had a population-based study focused on family functioning was 1988. And so I decided that that was too long and that a lot had changed since 1988 and I would write a grant to try to study um, contemporary families. I also decided that if we're gonna do a project focused on families that we should include all families and we should include fully powered samples of all families to look at all families. So that's this project. Um, my primary co-investigator on this is Wendy Manning. Um, I have some other co-investigators listed here, Jane L. Ricks, Karen Rezik, and Wei Zhang. Um, and this was funded by NICHD last year, about a year ago. So the sample, uh, we're shooting to get about 670 women and men in same gender couples and also in different gender couples. The couples will be able to be either married or cohabiting. We're going to recruit over 24 months from the Gallup panel and Gallup recontact samples. And part of the reason that I'm working with Gallup is that um, back in the day, you could do a random digit dial of phone numbers in the United States and get a population-based sample and people would pick up their phones, but that doesn't happen anymore. We also have a case here where we have a very low incidence population of same gender couples that are harder to find. Gallup has over 100,000 people in their Gallup panel and they also ask individuals if they are willing to be recontacted and so we can pull from the Gallup panel the entire different gender sample and we can pull using the panel and the recontact sample um, both we can pull the same gender couple sample the reason that we're going to be using the recontact sample is because we want to have an oversample of individuals who are racial and ethnic minorities of about hopefully 25% of the sample and because the intersection of those two identities and survey research is small we will be reaching back out to some individuals thank you so all the partners will be invited to participate. Gallup is estimating that we'll have 50% of partners say yes. We're getting ready to go into the field with a pilot. I'm hoping um, that that will happen in the next, oh gosh, let's see here, probably four to six weeks. Um, and so we'll have a better idea of what our actual uptake is gonna be in terms of partner data at that point. Well, so as I mentioned, we'll have an oversample of racial and ethnic minorities. The sample size is supposed to be over 1,000 individuals who identify as racial and ethnic minorities across different and same gender families. This study is also, also multi-method, kind of like the New Parents Project. So we will have a survey. Um, we're gonna collect data on family functioning, division of labor, health, stress, and discrimination. Um, we have time diaries embedded as well. So after you're done with the survey, you're assigned a day to do your time diary. And we are asking about activities on weekdays and weekend days. Um, we do are gonna have more detail on some family activities than you would get in the American Time Use Survey. Um, and we're hoping to get dyadic time diary data because I love that dyadic time diary paper and I would love to have more data like that, and I think it's really interesting. Um, I should also mention that at the end of their survey day, we are going to be asking if they've had any discriminatory experiences the day before and when those happened. And what we're hoping to get from that data is that we're also going to be asking people how stressed they were and how happy they felt during activities. So we might be able to map like a microaggression or a macroaggression onto their experience the day before and see if that like shifted the valence of the day, for example. So there's lots of research questions to be answered with that. We'll have contextual data, and then we're also collecting five dry blood spots, and that's with money from um, the Institute for Population Research at Ohio State, and we also have an R01 that will be going back in once we know better what our response rates are. Um, and we're going to be assaying some of the blood spots for stress biomarkers, but we're also hoping to create a biorepository as well. And also, because I'm a demographer, I'm hoping that all of these data will be publicly available, though um, as I've had conversations here, I um, could use a lot of expertise here in how to make that happen and what should be publicly available and what not. 
If you're interested in seeing a draft of the survey, I put made this little bit.ly, this little short thing. It's go.osu.edu slash nchat survey, and you can click on that link or go to that website, and you can see a draft of what we currently have. I'm still taking, if you notice anything, send me an email. If you notice a typo or something, I'd love to hear about it, because um, so, we haven't gone in the field yet. Um, and like I said, all these data will be made publicly available. I did have a picture here of ICPSR, but if I came to Minnesota, they can be publicly available through <laughs> MPC. And these are some of my collaborators, and I can't believe I ended on time. <laughs> Are you okay fielding questions? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm curious how you work with all of this, the idea of class. And um, I'm particularly thinking of when I look at Amato's work, for example, yeah. going together, yeah. the mural happiness, what you really <coughs> concluded was, you know, if you take composite numbers, you get this kind of flat line. Yeah. But then if you divide up couples in economic distress versus not in economic distress, they go like this. Yeah. The opposite direction. Right. So that the composite numbers float. Mm -hmm. really so maybe one thing I could do is like an interaction with education. Yeah, well, it, it, I mean, again, he had some different measures. Uh, the, the, the one I found most dramatic was yeah. economic distress. Yes, right. But of course, a lot of the second demographic transition data is education. Right, and so the good news is we'll have that data um, to be able to do that kind of modeling. Um, so yeah, because right, like with the current data, the GSS, that my best, that would probably be the education indicator, though. I think there also is an income in there, but I haven't looked at what the missing data looks like in. <coughs> So that's another possibility. So awesome whirlwind tour. <laughs> uh, I was trying to think of a question that kind of goes over it all, but maybe one general one I'd be interested in your reflections on, um, especially given this department, sociology and yeah. arts history, is how do you see life course um, work and theory fitting in um, in the field of sociology as well as in population demography. So mm -hmm. kind of taking a step up, right. situating not just yourself and your work, but all of that kind of work um, and as a way, you know, how to build on that or where its yeah. status is and its role in programs and departments. Well, I think, and one interesting thing about like course theory is that um, I've like, and the same critique has been made of um, Brock and Brenner's theory is that sometimes it's like, well, how do you just prove it? You know, like it just feels like it can explain like almost everything. I guess when I think about it situated in the sociological literature, it seems like it's been really important. It's informing a lot of work. But maybe one thing that it doesn't inform quite as much as it should are data collections. Um, as we think about how we're shaping our population data collections and our family demography data collections, if we take a life course perspective, we might ask things slightly differently. Um, and so I guess that's one way that I think that like with these two projects, the life course perspective is definitely influencing the shape of these projects. I'm hoping to go back to the NCHAT sample. And you know, the timing of that and what that looks like would probably be informed partly by life course research. And so I think that we can make better data sets with more interesting contextual variables when we're taking that approach. And our contextual things right now are pretty, I mean, usually just demographic indicators. So it's one thing I like about these projects is trying to think a lot more about context in new different ways. So, you know, like now we're doing spatial data, so there are ways that sociologists, I think, are thinking broader about these things. Um, Miriam. Yeah, um, I particularly liked um, your lining up of yeah. what the the man and the woman were doing at the yeah. same time. Um, I was wondering, I my knowledge of the American timing statement is pretty shallow, but I believe that um, another dimension that is asked in that is, who were you with? Yeah. And did, I guess two more questions. You do have that. Yeah, you do have that? Yeah. That, that might be another thing you wanted to factor into that. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, if the woman is doing childcare and the man's doing childcare at yeah. the same time, yeah. is she saying that she's with him? Yeah. Or is she thinking, like, oh, I was in the room, but I was the one doing the childcare? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot more, there's several more papers in these time diaries that we have from the New Parents Project, so if people think it's interesting and they come, please come see me. Um, but that would be really interesting. That's a really interesting idea. Yeah, so um, thanks for this, it's really interesting. I'm thinking 
thinking about the first piece about yeah. um, marital quality and um, wanted to ask about kind of how to put together the pieces of the theoretical argument. So it seems like you're saying there's this Maslow piece where as social on a social on a societally wide level, yes. like material needs are met, and so yes. have higher expectations. Yes. But then it also seems like the way that you're talking about it is that the real shift is a shift toward seeing those as being possible to be met by one person. Yes, exactly. Instead of having like a broader. So I'm not sure how those fit together mm -hmm. and why having material needs met would mean that marriage becomes the vehicle. Okay, that's interesting. So, so like as we have our material needs met, and the basic argument is that then we have higher expectations of our spouse, and we move on to the purpose of marriage being more about meeting our higher order needs. But part of the reason why that could be happening is that we are then relying less on other people. Right, so I don't get that part. Yeah, so that part of it had us up it in. So I guess one way we could think about it is that if you do have your material needs met and you might be relying less on other people, uh, it's possible you rely less on other people if you have material needs met and wouldn't, I mean, I'm just thinking like extended family and the ways that family can like help you or neighbors. Um, so it really has me thinking a lot about maybe doing some kind of interaction with education or something there. Um, because I think it is possible that as you have those basic needs met, you could be more self-sufficient as a couple and rely less on others. But that's what I would probably say. I don't know if that theoretically holds or not. So I don't, I don't mean to get too much into the weeds with this question, but I, I was thinking about that. Yeah. Doesn't the GSS ask questions about organizational involvement? And yeah, now I'm like, thinking about maybe I should put that in there. Yeah, yeah. I could put organizational involvement, or they, they have like some size of network questions. Potentially. I have to look at the data, but this is a really good idea. Thank you all. This is a really good idea for me to try to expand this idea of how, you know, they think they have shown that organizational involvement has gone down. You can see if that accounts for some of these trends which is a really good idea. In the, in the work in family, I didn't have room to do this in the National Couples of Health and Time study because it's so hard to get that survey down to size. But in the work and family life study, I am going to be putting in a measure of this idea of your diversified social network. So how many people do you have to rely on? I just didn't have room in NCHAT, but in the online supplement for waffles, I'm hoping to get maybe more directly at this idea. Um, yeah, so also on that first piece, um, I was a little um, curious because like you're you're looking at marriage happiness over a very long period. Yeah. Right? So I'm wondering, like, couldn't it just be that the definition of a happy marriage has changed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So what do you know about that? Totally be. Um, well, that's kind of the, I guess I'm not, I'm not able to get it, but they're, like, how they're perceiving their definition. Like happy marriage back in, you know, the like typical like 1950s happy marriage that today could be viewed as a very unhappy marriage. Oh, absolutely. Right, so the same marriage is at this two different time periods. And that would be the period effect. Okay. But, right, but so, so like the only way for me to get at what you're suggesting is for me to ask people what their perceptions of a happy marriage is and okay. to be able to kind of look at that. Okay. And I couldn't ask so it today because of the period effects. If I had some kind of like more qualitative interview kind of data, maybe I could better get at well, that. But you do have quite a bit in the GSS, and I don't know, I didn't quite pay attention to completely, probably not, not enough at least to your specification, but um, like, don't you have, do, don't they ask different members of each, each uh, uh, you know, how to independently rate their marriage, right? Each spouse? They or? don't have partners. Like, there's very little women, idea. but do, do you have yeah. the spouse's characteristics? Um, like, I, I think, think there's times because I was looking at that to try to figure out if I could get this age issue. They do have. Uh, there are waves where they have a few questions about the partner, but it's not consistent okay. over the waves, okay. which is one problem I'm running into. Well, even if you don't have the partner's marriage, like um, the partner's <laughs> the partner's characteristics, I think you could still get a lot. Uh, get try to dig a little bit deeper into this in terms of like, so especially the education differences because yeah. a happy marriage of a highly educated woman, you know, and of yeah. course the definition of a highly educated woman has changed over this time period, right. but a happy marriage of a highly educated woman, you know, uh, 60 years ago versus today is quite different. Yeah, that's a good point. So, and the idea that the definition of what highly educated is has yeah, changed. Yeah, just it, like, I think we need to pay a lot more attention <laughs> to how people, like how the, the self-rated, how self-rated happiness in marriage has changed over time. Right, which is unprecedented. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, I just had a, a follow up also on June's question. Um, you know, you indicate that we, the diverging destinies yeah. argument isn't necessarily consistent with what you found in yeah. the marital happiness paper. And I guess I'm wondering, like, what you would expect to find. So we saw marital happiness going yeah. down, and I think your argument is that if people are selecting into marriage, it shouldn't go down as much. But yeah. um, but you but because you didn't have education or something in there, we don't. You, I do have say, education in there. You do. I'm okay. controlling for education, okay. but I'm not looking okay. within education. So I'm thinking that maybe I should do an interaction, which might better be able to get at this issue. Because um, hasn't like I feel Philip Cohen was talking that isn't the divorce rate going down, or he was talking talking about that. So if the divorce, so that would give further evidence to maybe we do have some selection to marriage but of course we could have selection to marriage on divorce but it doesn't mean you have a happier marriage people could just be seen in their marriages so anyway these are things that I still have to and also your results they aren't driven like if I remember that um, breakdown of like super happy pretty happy not happy not too happy like it's mostly driven from people going from super happy to like medium happy yes exactly because there's like nobody who says like yeah. this is a crappy marriage exactly and I don't want to be in it um, even though they probably should, but yeah. Um, so I mean, that's one way that I, I've it's kind not of really. I way. mean, so it's again, it's like, what's the difference between a super happy and a pretty happy marriage? Well, I think that there it can have implications. Well, what I want to try to do is see if it has implications for your mental health. Yeah, but how has that changed? Like, you know, what? How do I call? Uh, okay, I'll stop talking because I'm just harping <laughs> on the same thing. But I just think it's really important. To, especially particularly for the interpretation of your results because you're like oh this is really like a terrible thing going on but it's just that more people are saying that they're somewhat happy rather than super happy well i wouldn't say that i was saying oh it's a terrible thing going on i would say these are some estimates that i have right now that what i think is going on yeah, but and like, i would also yeah. say that it's not that people aren't happy with their marriage i would i one way i've been talking about this is the rise of the mediocre marriage so it's more i'm pretty happy I'm not very happy. Mm -hmm. And if we have people, everybody's pretty happy in their marriage, maybe that's good enough. But because we only have a three-point measure of marriage and we have very few people in the very bottom measure, like for the National Couples' of Health and Time study, we're using a seven-point, like four items, a seven-point measure, and the very top category is that my marriage is perfect. <laughs> and that has like a lot of like measurement, you know, a lot of research on measurement behind it. This is a three item measure that they put in in 1973. So I definitely would not suggest this is the end all be all. This is one window into starting to look at these trends and I hope that with our other data we'll be getting a much better idea of what's going on. Yeah, uh, I don't know I asked, I want to follow up on Elizabeth's yeah. question just in terms of the theory on this. Yeah. I would, it got me thinking about whether there's cultural differences, and so maybe is there comparative yeah. case data mm -hmm. that could help us make sense of what whether this is a distinctive oh, U.S. A idea. American kind of pattern versus yeah. other cultural context. That's a great idea. That's a really, really good idea, especially when you think about the second demographic transition. So I will think about that. Thank you for that. Uh, when you were talking about the previous research conducted on marital satisfaction, you mentioned that this U-shaped curve is driven by having a kid. So people experience well, that was uh, the explanation people oh, used right. to say that you would have a child. And well, we do a lot of research that shows that the transition parenthood is bad for relationships. Okay, is that something you also found? And have you? And I guess my question yeah. is, have you compared to childless married couples? Uh, that's an interesting idea. Um, and so, of course, in the New Parents Project, it's about the transition to parenthood. And the GSS data, that's interesting, whether there's a different trend for childless versus child. I could do that, that's interesting. I'll we'll try to look at that, that's an interesting idea. Because it could be that they haven't experienced those, because then you could think about women moving into the workforce. There's so many other period and cohort effects happening here at the same time, so that's a good idea. Thank you for that. I think we're, looks like we're close to the end of time. So let's uh, please join me in, in thanking Claire.